Hello, everyone. Salam alaikum. Welcome you to this uh, very special webinar on Muhammad Ali, an interfaith leader before we knew what that was. I want to welcome uh, the two people I'm going to be in discussion with in this webinar. Uh, the first is Donna Austin, who is an anthropologist, a writer, a public intellectual, whose body of work focuses on race, ethnicity, gender, religion, social and protest movements, media representation, and Islam in America. She's completing her dissertation at Rutgers, Rutgers University, which is an ethnog on an ethnography of Black Muslim activism and spiritual protest in the Black Lives Matter era, uh, named one of 100 Muslim social justice leaders by Empower Change. Sister Donna, we're thrilled to have you with us. Thank you for taking the time and offering your insight and wisdom. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here. And David McMahon, uh, who is one of the makers of this film, uh, somebody I've been on a panel with uh, 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 right when the film came out, uh, WTTW, um, uh, it, it's the Chicago Public Television Station, made several other films, uh, including the Central Park Five, Jackie Robinson, and East Lake Meadows, a public housing story. Uh, uh, thank you again, David, for, for, for being with us. And one of the things I want to say to you is, what you've made is 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 a work of art. I, I've said that before, but it is it is so beautifully and perfectly crafted. The music, the pacing, the voices, uh, um, the kind of cradle cradle to grave nature, the larger social story it tells. Uh, I want to thank you for the film, and I want to thank both you and Sister Donna for how you are going to illuminate uh, a dimension of this film with with us today. Thank you, Ibu. I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm I'm honored to be sharing a screen with Donna, who appears in the film, and um, did a lot to clarify for me the importance of of Muhammad Ali's spirituality while we were making the movie. So, really glad to be here. Great. So I want to, you know, everybody has a Muhammad Ali story. I think that somebody actually says says that in the film, right? And and we at IFYC actually have our own Muhammad Ali story. Mm -hmm. um, uh, back in the early days of the organization when part of what we would do is, is have uh, the high school and college students who are part of our first project at IFYC, which is called the Chicago Youth Council, they would do a kind of performance at the Greater Chicago Leadership Prayer Breakfast that you know, the mayor and the senators from Illinois would, would host. And there'd be a thousand kind of business, religious, civic leaders at the Hilton on South Michigan Avenue. And this must have been 2004, 2005, maybe. We were preparing for our performance. We'd gotten kind of all, you know, uh, uh, we, we put on the, the performance clothes. We were exiting out of the, the green room area and we get to the elevators and the elevator opens and there's Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and he is glowing. He's resplendent, right? In his, in his own way, even, even, even at that time in his, in his life. Uh, um, and uh, we, you know, salam alaikum to the champ. And um, one of his kind of entourage says, you know, what, what, what are a bunch of young people doing at the mayor's leadership prayer breakfast, right? You're, you're not the typical audience. And I said that we were doing a performance about interfaith cooperation. And Ali kind of nods and like raises his arm and he basically blesses us. And I will never forget that moment. I'll never forget that moment, right? Because it felt like, you know, it felt like being in the presence of a sheikh, right? It felt like being in the presence of, of somebody who, uh, whose blessing you, one seeks. You know, in Islam, uh, there, there's a tradition of, of, um, of visiting the graves of holy people, right? Rumi's grave in, uh, in Koinia in Turkey, uh, the dargahs of the great saints of South Asia, and, and it's because they lived holy lives. And that's how it felt being in the presence of Ali that day. And David, I wanna, I wanna ask you about, not all of Ali's life was holy, right? And, and you're, you pull no punches in the, in the, in, you know, uh, in the film about this, but Ali changes, Ali changes. And he actually says, uh, I think it's in the beginning of the second episode, he says, the wise man changes, and I'm a wise man, right? Can you talk about what were some of the most powerful changes in, in Ali's life that you learned about in the making of the film? Like, like what felt the most powerful and profound and personal for you? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to address this in two ways. Um, Muhammad Ali was a boxer, 
And you can see this evolution in his fighting across his career. Um, he starts out as a guy who's virtually unhittable. And in the 1960s, in the mid 1960s, as the heavyweight champion of the world, he's at the absolute height of his physical abilities. And at that time, he's um, drafted, but he refuses induction into the US Army. And he loses in doing this three years of his best athletic self. And when he returns, he's slower. And what he did in giving up those three years was give up a chance to retain his heavyweight crown, to make a lot of money, and to grow his fame. And I think it's real evidence of the commitment that he had to his faith, that he was willing to do that. Um, when he comes back, oh, he also was risking five years in prison in doing this. And so there's no doubting the authenticity of his commitment to his faith and to not being part of this war in Vietnam. When he comes back, he's a much different fighter. He's slower and he has to fight in a different way, but he makes these adjustments. And over the years, he climbs back and wins back the title that was taken away from him, which really kind of ratifies for everyone the depths of his commitment to his faith. All of this is taken away from him, but he's gonna to stick to his principles and he's still going to win back his crown. And he's gonna tell you that he's gonna do it on behalf of all the people who don't have a voice. And so I have such admiration for him for how he was able to change in the ring and still meet his goals as an athlete. Out of the ring, we really saw this movie as a spiritual journey. And as Donna helped illuminate for me, this is a man growing up in Louisville as a teenager, and he can see that he's considered a second class citizenship. All the signals around him say, this is not a space that's for you. And I think when he discovers the nation of Islam, it clarifies for him and helps make sense of this world for him. He has a place where he can be a part of a community. He has leaders and people who are pointing him in a new direction. He has a new commitment to this faith. And I think it guides the rest of his life. We see him in the ring before he fights, he bows in prayer. After the ring, he thanks, after the fight, he thanks Allah. He talks constantly about the honorable Elijah Muhammad. He always says, I don't know how much he means this, but he always says, it's okay if I don't have another fight. That's not necessarily the purpose of why I'm here. But he does say it and he consistently says it. But when he joined the Nation of Islam, it was not necessarily for solely for spiritual reasons. It was also about making sense of this segregated world that he inhabited. And Elijah Muhammad had a particular trajectory for the Nation of Islam, but that meant one thing in the 60s, it meant another thing in the 70s. Muhammad Ali is often parroting what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is saying in his public utterances. But when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad dies and his son Wallace takes the organization in another direction. Muhammad comfortably goes in that direction too. It's a bigger, more open version of Islam, more mainstream that he's practicing. And he practices that across the rest of his life. And it's a big open hearted mission that he's on. And it really, so you see this evolution from a guy who can sit before Bud Collins as a 20 something uh, boxer and say, I'm for George Wallace because he speaks truths about segregation to a guy who can travel the world in his retired days suffering from Parkinson and connect with everybody everywhere. And it's a big open-hearted version of his faith. And at the very end, he has the thoughtfulness as he's taken an accounting of his life to say, this is what I got wrong. And I'm okay addressing that. I'm okay, I'm gonna atone for it now. I maybe wasn't always good to my, to my wives. I didn't treat Malcolm X very well. I wish I had handled that differently. I was not kind to Joe Frazier. I wish I had handled that differently. And for us as filmmakers, we don't wanna tell a story about a guy who is superhuman. We wanna make a portrait of a flawed human and make him seem as human as possible. And we're grateful to him for pointing us to, at the ways in which he was flawed. But I think that's through his faith that he could come to terms with what mistakes he made and publicly speak about him. He's often an open book, willing to share who he is, which made him such a compelling subject. So I wanna, David, that was a lot. Thank you for that. I wanna underscore one of, one of the many parts of what you say and then kind of present it to Donna. Um, so part of what I'm hearing you say, David, is it is because Ali is Muslim that it is, it, let me rephrase that. Islam gives Ali the strength to change, to change the kind of Muslim he is, to apologize for some of the things that some of the hurts and harms he causes. And they're, they're plenty. And, and the film is open about that, right? Um, 
but there is there is a different kind of courage that Islam gives Ali, the human being, not the boxer, but the human being that allows him to face up to 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 past selves he wished had gotten more things right. I'm curious, Donna, what 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 you might make of that? Yeah, I mean, I think for for um, me, both as a a person who studies religion professionally, um, but also as a, a believing person, as a as a as someone who um, you know attempts to implement Islam in my own life, I think um, one of the things that I understand religion um, to be for is is it's it's religion is not sort of a handbook for already perfect people. I mean, you know, religion and spirituality is 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 a is a guide to help you to approximate um, what you understand perfection to be or nearness to the divine to be, right? Um, and that means that, you know, I mean, I think it, it, it sounds maybe a bit cliche, but sort of we all fall short, but, you know, but if you are somebody who takes your spiritual path seriously, right, the idea is that you're always trying to, to get there. And I think that a lot of, um, a lot of the experiences, um, uh, that Muhammad Ali had in his life, being stripped from his title when he was, you know, certainly at the peak of his athletic prowess um, in many ways, and and all of those things actually. So taking that, taking the step in that direction, um, and they were huge steps because, right, as David mentioned, and you know, as the history books tell us, right, you know, Ali was he sacrificed quite a bit in order to, um, in order to take this particular position, right, that was in line with his his spiritual beliefs, right. Um, about, you know, making war on the innocents, particularly um, and within the context of the nation of Islam, um, it's not just random innocence, right? But, but theology and cosmology and the way that the world is ordered um, and relationships to the divine are understood from the perspective of a racialized Black person in North America, right? And all of that and what and all of that that comes along with that, right? So he's understanding his place in the world uh, through this lens of you know of 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 the you know of being a black person born in segregated Jim Crow or Louisville, right? Um, and and so his his journey. Um, those things and, and those things are always working in tandem with one another, right? His spirituality is constituted um, through his political experiences. His political experiences, his racial experiences, are also sort of uh, clarified um, through his practice of religion. And he continues to move in the direction um, that he that he understands to be taking him closer to um, you know to cl closer to his maker. And I think. Um, uh, one of the other things that I'll emphasize here, right, is that, you know, the beginning of someone's spiritual journey um, doesn't necessarily mean that they have all of the answers <laughs> right at the start of it. I mean, I think that's the idea, although often faith can be expressed in ways um, that communicate surety on the part of believers at any particular moment in time, right? But it's always open to expansion. Um, it's always open and open to being deepened by the experiences that you have in the world. I mean, the things that Ali experienced on so many levels are are really extraordinary um, for it in terms of how most humans live their lives. Most of us live our lives in a, in a much more average way, right? But all of these experiences, both the things that are happening to him sort of on the macro public level, but also the things that are happening in his spiritual life, his personal life, um, his family life, um, or actually, sh you know, shape him into the person that he later became. And he made, and he moved with that, you know? And so what we see at the end of his life um, is not exactly the same as what we see at the beginning of his life. But I, but I also don't think they're, they're quite, they're always quite as different um, as sometimes narratives posit. Because I think that core is there. It's just a matter of, it, it's sculpting. Life is, a, is a sort of a sculpting process, I think, for all of us, right? We, you know, you start it, we have this block of clay, right? And this, 
this experience will chisel you and this experience will shape you and this, right? And then when you, when you come out at the end, you have something that's, um, that doesn't look exactly like what you started with. And I think that's, that's sort of the goal of, um, of, I think, probably any spiritual practice, right? You're actually just, you're trying to get something that's a little bit more refined and chiseled than what you started with. Yeah. Hey, there's a great line attributed to Michelangelo. The angel already exists in the stone. The sculptor releases it or life releases it. Or in this case, and I, you know, the, 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 the different ways that Ali and, uh, um, orients around Islam helps release a different, a different part of him. You know, I, I, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to deviate from the script a little bit here and, and ask, and ask a, a question that continually came up to me for me as I was watching this film, uh, you know, as I'm particularly the way that Ali speaks of Joe Frazier in the '70s, I mean, it's it, like it's it's painful to watch. It's painful to watch, and I wonder sometimes, did Ali create a public character for himself that he felt trapped by, and he didn't want to be that guy anymore? But in effect, who he was in 1965, he felt like he had to be publicly on stage in 1975, even if that was not in his heart. David, I'm curious. I mean, like you're, you're close to the material. And then, of course, Don, I want to I want to come to you on this also. Yeah, I think the Ali the showman is an authentic version of Ali. I think as a young man, he's before he's won the title, he's braggadocious. He is drawing from Gorgeous George, the professional wrestler, who's not a pre, a, a pre, uh, excuse me, afraid to talk about how pretty he is. This is the, the late 1950s. And he's seeing that it's okay as a, as a performer to be loathed as much as loved because it's still gonna put butts in the seats. And so he does craft this kind of public showman persona. And part of that is a kind of um, pre-fight psychological advantage that he's seeking against his opponents. And so he'll identify something about them um, and make it a contest of that. It can be as big as a battle between Christianity and Islam, or it can be who's more authentically black. But that for him is about making the fight about something bigger than a fight. And I think he knows that it plays to his advantage because he psychs out his opponents and it draws more eyeballs. It makes the thing more of an event. He's very successful as that. The promoters would say, he's better at promoting the fights than we are. Um, when, it, when it comes to Frazier, and I think right to the end of his career, he continues to do this. And by the 70s, I think he's struggling a little more to make the fights about something more than just being a prize fight. And I also think that a lot of the fighters sort of go along with it because as Ernie Shavers told me, Ernie Shavers was a boxer that Muhammad fought in the late 70s. There was my life before I fought Muhammad Ali and my life after I thought, fought Muhammad Ali. I was much more of a significant figure after I fought him. You know, so a lot of them went along for the ride, but he used such dark and brutal language in talking about Joe Frazier. As Todd Boyd says in the movie, this is the ultimate conscious black guy and he's using the language of white racists to frame Joe Frazier, a guy who was there to help him when he was out of the fight game by loaning him money and keeping in touch with him. And so it was brutal. But I, I think that it, it was a role that he felt comfortable playing. And it, Frazier was the one who got hurt by it the most, but he did play it right to the end. And he craved that public attention. He needed to connect with the people and they needed to connect with him. And so it's an unfortunate chapter. Um, and uh, he, he does uh, um, admit to it being dark later in his life, but I, I think he always thought Joe should know better, that this is just about playing up a fight and drawing eyeballs. And of course, Frazier didn't feel that way. And so I think later he, he had to try and make peace with how he treated him. Um, but it does fit into how Ali, the public figure, and Clay, the public figure, um, always comported himself uh, before and around fights. Donna, if you want, if you have a comment on that, uh, by by all means. I think the only thing that I would add to that is that I think it's important to understand all of these things within the context of the totality and the the extent to which white racist ideology impacts all of us, and that includes those of us who um, are the targets of it. Um, and it includes those of us who are, you know, 
you know, that includes white folks, right? It's it's not just, I mean, white racist ideology is, is something that many of us internalize and many of us struggle at various parts of our lives. And, and again, on our journey, right? To actually really rid ourselves of the types of things of, of being capable of believing and or sort of directing some of those same, you know, racist invectives um, against ourselves and those who look like us. And this comes out in a lot of different ways. So I don't, I think Ali is a, as a black man in America, um, regardless of how we understand him to be this sort of figure that, you know, that broke free of all of that, right? There's, it, it, it still takes conscious effort and a lot of work to really totally step outside of that. So I, I mean, I think, and I think it's, it's certainly something that, um, that shows up um, in various places um, and it can be very insidious and very and very sneaky sometimes, right? Even from people who we who we think quote unquote no, should know better, right? This is not colorism. Um, it's something. There's a whole history, you know, sort of behind how you know even black people understand and relate to, um, you know, the features that we or our family members have. Um, people being, you know, taunted for being darker skin, people, you know, being taunted for having hair that's a curlier texture. I mean, these things, I, I don't think, I think, you know, something that you said earlier, you know, is that, you know, sort of there's, you know, Muhammad Ali kind of, ha he has this superhuman um, place in our imagination, right? But he's also a person and he's he's not, you know, he he's not outside of all of those things that, were a part of his growing up. And I think any, um, pretty much any, or very, probably most of us would be able to admit to that. Mo most black people will tell you that they, they've seen this, they've witnessed it, they've experienced it. And many of us maybe have even engaged in that sort of banter, particularly when you um, understand, in addition to sort of being, you know, that, you know, uh, you know, sort of a promotional tactic of Ali's, you know, this, this tradition of playing the dozens, right, is very much a part of how, you know, uh, which is, you know, sort of a, you know, verbal sparring, right, you know, um, taunts, jokes, um, you know, cracking, whatever we call it, right, in our, in our local vernacular is a very, uh, is very much a part of, you know, Black American oral culture, right, um, and that can be, um, you know, roasting can be can be pretty harsh um, at times, right? In that in that in that sort of tradition, and and in many cases, many of us, if we're not careful, right? Um, if we're not cognizant of this, can actually fall into some of the same um, because we've been watching the same media, right? That that sort of this you know white media industrial complex is put out about black people. We've been watching, we've been ingesting the same, we've been reading the same history books. We've been, you know, we've been taught from the same, you know, apparatus, this same white supremacist apparatus as everybody else. And it really um, gives you a sense of how severe a job um, that all of that does to a person, right? And so I, I think, um, I, you know, it's, 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 it is unfortunate, it is dark, but I think we do have to understand that, yes, Ali in many ways, um, you know, sort of went above, um, and uh, I, I hate the word transcend, and, and I guess maybe we can talk about, because <laughs> I think this will come up later in some of the questions that I know we had planned. I think often when we think about people who we revere, you know, we understand them to not be sort of uh, subject to all of the all of the mundane, terrible, you know, oppressive, difficult things that we all struggle with, right? But Ali is not outside of that. At the end of the day, he was still a black man raised in the Jim Crow South, and that does a number on people. It just it does a number, and it's very difficult to get out of it. Yeah. Thank you. That's that is powerfully said. So you know, I remember when when Ali dies. Uh, I think it's June two thousand sixteen, right? And this is like right in the teeth of this racist Trump campaign. And I remember I'm on a flight back from D.C. or New York to Chicago, and I I like purchased the four ninety five, you know, 
uh, viewing uh, the TV on the on the plane, and I watched I watched the funeral, and it's like a state funeral. That that's the only way I can describe it. It's on every channel. It's on ESPN. It's on NBC. It's like a state funeral. Bill Clinton speaks. You know, um, uh, and one of the final speakers is Billy Crystal, and he tells this story that I just found so deeply moving. He says that um, uh, he, you know, uh, he's in Louisville one day, uh, maybe I don't know, it's 70s or 80s, and uh, um, he says to uh, Muhammad Ali, you, you know, or Ali says to, to Billy Crystal, you want to go for a run tomorrow? And Billy Crystal says, uh, nah, you know, it's okay, thanks so much. And Ali's like ribbing him. He's like, oh, you too afraid to like do a five mile jog with the champ? And Billy Crystal says, actually, no, the place where you run the Louisville Country Club, I can't go. I'm Jewish. Doesn't let Jews in. And Billy Crystal says, like, Ali is so infuriated like by that, just like viscerally infuriated, right? It's this, it's this instinctive set of principles that I think one sees around Ali in, in many instances. Um, and Ali like doesn't run at that country club again. And, and it's this, you know, I, it's this way of Ali saying, you're not just my friend, you are part of the diversity of human creation. And it is my job as a human being, as a champ, as a Muslim, to stand up and cherish and protect the diversity of human creation. And wherever that is not, uh, that is not cherished and protected, I'm not going to be a part of that place, you know? And, and I'm curious, either David or Donna, are there other instances that like pop out to you of Ali being what we at IFYC would call an interfaith leader, which is basically somebody who, takes inspiration from their own tradition, which is can be anything from secular humanism to Shia Islam or evangelical Christianity or Orthodox Judaism to proactively partner with people from other traditions, including protecting them if protection is necessary and required. Yeah, well, I'll, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, I think what astonished me about Ali always was his authenticity and um, He's always been true to that effort, I think, to live his faith. Um, he's a showman, and that's a big part of who he is, but he can't perform a magic trick without then showing the people who have just seen it how it is that he performed it, right? What the secret is. And so I think that's him staying true to his, his faith and his tradition and who he wants to be. Um, and he does these acts of good, I think, out of the spotlight, away from the cameras. He's doing them all the time. Um, one story that we could unfortunately include in the movie came to us from Bernadine Dorn, the activist and Chica University of Chicago trained lawyer, who, um, as she tells it, was a second year law student and was at a church gathered with a number of, of uh, activists. Um, and they were plotting, they were working with Dr. King and they were plotting their next move when word came in that down the street there was an eviction unfolding. And so they quick jumped up from their chairs and ran down the block. And when they got there, the sheriff's deputies had removed all the furniture from the apartment on the second floor and put it out on the curb. And she's standing there watching this unfold, kind of feeling helpless. And she says, you know that moment when somebody bigger than you sort of appears beside you and you haven't seen them yet, but you can feel that they're there. And she said, this happened to me. And I turned and looked and there was Muhammad Ali. He had also heard what was happening. He had come from wherever he was and he was sharply dressed and he took his jacket off and handed it to her. And he walked over to the pile and picked up a coffee table or something. And in the face of the sheriff dep deputies and the crowd gathered, walked it up the stairs and back into the apartment. And immediately everybody uh, jumped in and did the same. And within a few minutes, they had restored the apartment to what it was. And then he came back to her, as she described in a kind of cinematic way, and took the jacket from her and disappeared. And so I think cameras on, cameras off, he was always trying to, you know, raise humanity where he could, whether people's faith, whatever their skin color, whatever their traditions, he saw people as humans. And you spoke to this at the beginning. When he did this, he imprinted heavily on everybody he encountered. Everybody I met while making this movie who had a Muhammad Ali encounter told the, it with the detail as though it had happened the day before. They remembered every aspect of it. 
And it felt like a pivotal moment in their life. I don't want to overstate that, but it, there is a, some truth to how he was able to leave people with an impression, whether it was an action he took. And funny, he would always say, I'm not a leader. There's only one leader. It's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But then he would do things that would show people the way. And so I was amazed at no matter what corner of the earth he was in, he could act in a way or connect with people in a meaningful way that would leave them with a memory that they would share or build on for the rest of their lives. I would just say, um, just in addition to that, um, there's a couple of things. Um, one, um, I was invited to um, a conference on Islamophobia in, that was a couple of years ago. Um, and I was, it was in Louisville actually. And one of the things that, um, that was remarkable, um, you know, of course, many people who were there um, had stories, um, but one of the other speakers at this particular conference, one of the things that he pointed out, he was a Louisville native, um, and he was talking, um, part of his presentation was about um, the ways that, uh, you know, the, the incident where Muhammad Ali Jr. was actually stopped and detained um, at an airport. Um, profiled as a Muslim and detained. And, you know, this was sort of, a, you know, talking about his presentation and he was, and when he was, you know, telling the stories around that, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, he was talking about was the ways that the city of Louisville and people who lived in Louisville um, loved Muhammad Ali so much. And one of the, one of the features of his, you know, of, of his presence there in the city, of course, you know, aside from, you know, everything that he'd done in his life um, was that he, he would, be found on a random corner on campus, um, you know, passing out Qurans and, and really acting as an ambassador for his faith to people, you know, just average folks like, you know, he's sitting by, you know, he has a trunk full of literature and he's just sort of, you know, parked on campus and giving out Qurans to whoever happens to be passing by and, you know, engaging in conversation with them and just sort of that, that human you know, just everyday human contact was something that I think if you're if you're thinking about his interfaith legacy, that's one of the um, one of the most powerful places to look. One of the other things that I would mention, of course, is his refusal um, to go to to be deployed to Vietnam at great personal cost um, to kill people who he saw as you know, as, as, as his, as his fellow human beings that didn't deserve to be murdered. I mean, I think we underestimate and, and particularly in the way that this was articulated as, um, a, a faith-based stand. I mean, on the basis of his religiosity, his spiritual path, this was something that his conscience could not allow him to do. Um, at that time, um, I don't know, probably 99% of Americans had never heard of Muslims or Islam. They certainly hadn't heard of uh, the nation of Islam, more than likely, unless they lived in Detroit or Chicago or someplace like that. Um, so, you know, but, but actually articulating this set of principles that, um, that are concerned with the preservation of human life, um, that are concerned with um, sort of, you know, at, you know, taking an active stand against violence and imperialism and militarism as a, as a, as a religious principle um, and actually framing that for people in a way that they could understand, um, you know, to people who had generally, many of whom had no prior exposure to this, uh, this to this faith tradition, or even to thinking about, you um, this type of action, right? As I mean, yes, there are you know certainly conscientious conscientious objectors of other faith traditions before him, right? But actually, being able because of who he was as an athlete and a public figure, being able to actually articulate this on a worldwide scale, um, I think is something uh, that is really a huge part of his interfaith legacy, if we're talking about it in that way. I think for many people, um, even though this was certainly something, I, again, that I think we, we 
you know, if you if you're a student of his life at all, you understand was was connected deeply to his spiritual path. Um, he certainly articulated that, and the basis on which his case was ultimately dismissed was because the the the, the legal clerk in his case, you know, really understood that this was not you know not quote unquote a political decision necessarily, right? Even though I don't think there's a neat separation between those two domains. Right, but this was actually rooted in um, rooted in his his spirituality. I think gay. I think empowered, right, um, and expanded the realm of possibilities for what faith is capable of and what types of issues that faith is capable of speaking to, right, um, in the larger society. So I think uh, I think that's definitely one of the ways that he um, that he sort of uh, shines in that area. Yeah, that, that's powerful. Thank you for that, Donna. You know, one thing I think that's worth highlighting is uh, the United States, for better or worse, has a constitutional architecture that effectively privileges faith. Um, amongst identities, it privileges religious identity. And the Muhammad Ali Supreme Court case is a really powerful illustration of this. If Muhammad Ali had said, I don't want to go fight in Vietnam because I'm a Democrat, he doesn't win. He's got no case. If he says, I don't want to go fight in Vietnam because I'm in my 20s, he doesn't have a case. If he says, I don't want to go fight in Vietnam because I'm black, that's not a case. But I don't want to go fight in Vietnam because I'm Muslim. You can claim a conscientious objector status based on religious identity in America's constitutional framework. Uh, and I think it is worth noting that you know, the various dimensions of identity that are typically talked about. This is clearly not true of you, Donna, and David, given this film, it's not true of you either. But it's true on campuses, it's true in companies, et cetera. Um, we talk a lot about race, gender, sexuality. These are really important things. But the American constitutional framework privileges religious identity. Uh, uh, and the Muhammad Ali doesn't go to Vietnam and doesn't and wins his case based on that. What do you think we need to do to like elevate conversations about religious identity in the public discourse so that they're kind of equal to how important religious identity is the, in the constitutional framework? Well, if I could just um, add one thing to what you were saying, um, when Muhammad Ali refuses induction, um, the, that war is so popular. And it's also at a time when I think for those few people who did know about the nation of Islam, um, they viewed it with fear and trepidation. Mm -hmm. And what you see over time is a kind of evolution where by the time that case is decided, the country has moved against the war and there's less fear ar ar around the nation of Islam. I mean, that law clerk, he was seeking a way in which he could make sense of this case that invited the justices to see it as an issue of faith and a kind of authenticity that Muhammad Ali brought to that. And there was more of an openness. So I think the country was moving more towards Ali and by the early 70s, they were willing to accept he was right about the war and it's okay for him to practice that faith. And you know, the generation of the law clerk, he was a young man and his, he had an openness to those ideas um, and, and he brought the clerk, he and his fellow uh, clerks brought the justices along. And so um, I think that we were talking about evolution at the beginning and Ali evolving, but I, I think it's also important to consider that the country changed and Ali stuck to his principles. And yes, he was flawed, but we really did see a country that had an openness, I think, by the early 70s to Muhammad Ali being a practicing Muslim. And we see that, you know, starting with Howard Cosell White, reporters uh, begin to call him Muhammad Ali. And slowly, um, it, over time, more and more go along with that, whereas by the time that case is decided, many more uh, sportscasters and many more journalists are willing to call him Muhammad Ali. That wasn't true at the time when he refused induction. And so that's not quite the question you asked, but I think it's important to consider that um, popular opinion around this stuff um, can transform how the Supreme Court justices are interpreting the Constitution. Don, I want to I want to ask a version of that to you. So so thank you for that, David. Uh, um, so uh, Muhammad Ali dies uh, um, in June of 2016, and there is an event at the end of that summer, which which uh, is also kind of a Muslim moment in America. 
It's when Kizer Khan at the Democratic National Convention, a, a Muslim American gold star father, brandishes a constitution on the stage of the Democratic National Convention and says, Mr. Trump, I bet you've never read this, but my son died in a war for this. And he, there's probably no more important public figure, at least in the Democrat, in, in you know, blue America, for the next six or eight weeks than Kizer Khan. And it strikes me, Muhammad Ali is celebrated in part for his refusal to go to an unpopular war. Eric Holder says the most important thing Muhammad Ali did wasn't in the ring, it was his refusal to go to, to Vietnam, right? And Kizer Khan is celebrated for being a gold star father for his son's his American Muslim son, Humayun's decision to go to an unpopular war and not be conscripted, going voluntarily. And I watch this and I think to myself, however hateful Donald Trump is, and the man is hateful and the movement is hateful, this is a sign of American openness to Islam and Muslims because we can be complex. We can be opposed to wars and we can go to wars and we can still be cultural figures. Curious what you think of that, Donna. There's a lot. <laughs> um, what, I, what I can say is that um, I think what, I, what I'll start with at the outset is really to just highlight here um, that of course the American Muslim community um, if you can, a demographic, I should say, right? Because um, I think community implies more of a uniformness than there actually is, which is precisely the point I want to emphasize here, is that the American Muslim demographic is incredibly diverse along um, not only national, ethnic, racial, sectarian lines, but certainly in terms of political opinion, socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so both of these things represent sort of the story of American Muslims at some point, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think that's one thing that, <clears throat> that I'd like to uh, point out there. I think also though, one of the things um, that this represents, because of course these two moments are um, you know, separated by you know, 40 years or so um, in terms of time. And you know, a lot has changed since then and not necessarily all for the better. Um, this is post 9-11. And, and actually, as a matter of fact, um, I think the day after Ali's funeral or maybe two days later, um, you have the Pulse shooting in Florida um, where a Muslim was accused of shooting up, you know, a, a, a gay club. Um, you know, in killing a number of people. And so this was this really interesting juxtaposition for me experi experientially is that you have this really public moment where Muslims are sort of celebrated in, in, you know, through Ali, right? You know, this revered American Muslim figure. And then the very next day, we're sort of back to Muslims are terrorists and profiling and, and surveillance and, and all of these other things that we're experiencing. And one of the things that I understand about his or Khan's experience is like I that that moment actually is really complicated for me emotionally because on the you know on the one hand like what's happening here is not that he's accepted as a, he's not there because he's a human being he's there because he like he has to defend his humanity and the way to defend his humanity as a Muslim, because, because Muslims in this and in, in current, you know, sort of political discourse, certainly within the context of the last presidential election or, or that particular presidential election, I guess we've, we've had one since then, right? Um, within the context of that particular presidential election cycle, Muslims are really sort of taking center stage in a way like they hadn't before in terms of uh, that sphere of electoral politics, which is that we we are this securitized population. Like we're only understood within the context of, of national security. Like we're not actually people. We're not people who care about healthcare or who care about infrastructure or who care about, it's just, are you a terrorist or not? And the litmus test for this is that this couple, you know, Khizr Khan and his wife Ghazala have to stand in front of the public 
and defend the right of Muslims to be seen as human beings on the basis of the fact that these people sacrificed their son to the American military project. Now, I'm not necessarily, you know, this is not really a conversation per se about whether or not that's the right choice or not, but it, but the fact that this is what he has to offer up, what this family has to offer up in order to sort of act as a foil against bigotry and Islamophobia emanating from the, the pool of presidential candidates is, 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 really, is really problematic, right? And this is so, you know, so, and this is not an invective against uh, Khizr and Ghazala Khan at all, but it's an indictment of, it's an indictment of the American political machine that under, that still racializes people, that still, you know, that still oppresses people on the basis of social identity, race and religion, right? Being two of the most powerful vectors along which this happens, right? Because the, the whole discourse that he's speaking to is this, well, well, Muslims can't be American. They can't be one of us, right? And we all know who us is. Us is not the diversity of America, us is sort of, you know, implied, if not outright stated, uh, particularly when we're talking about the Trump years, in, in which more often than not, it was explicitly stated, not just through rhetoric, but also through policy, such as the Muslim ban, right? That America, that, that Muslims are default the enemy, and it's their job meaning our job, I'm speaking me now as an American Muslim, it's now my job to prove to everyone else that, um, that I'm not a threat, even though, you know, it, it, I mean, and, and so on, on the, on the, so on its, on its face, it's sort of this touching moment for a lot of people. Oh, wow, look at this family. But it's also, for me, begs the question, what, where are we as a as a nation where where people have to do that where they have to put their trauma on display in order to have a shot at being regarded as something of a human being who deserves all of the protections that the that the constitution that he held in his hand allegedly grants him and people who look like him and, and believe like him and practice their faith like he does. So for me, um, a little bit. It, David, are you still there? That wasn't actually a particularly okay. feel good moment, <laughs> um, to be honest. Yeah. It, it well, I, uh, I mean, I, I offer it simply as an interesting book, at, right? as as a, an interesting counterpoint, uh, and I appreciate I appreciate your interpretation of it. So we're moving towards the end here. I want to do a big thank you to both of you and ask kind of one final question, right? Um, uh, David, I'll ask you first, and then Donna, I'll ask you a, sli a slightly different one. David, in 50 years, how will Muhammad Ali be, be remembered? And then Donna, the question I have for you is, is Muhammad Ali is a, is a part of a powerful era of Black activism, right? And it's, it's the nation of Islam, it's Black pride, it's Black power, it's civil rights. And the beautiful movie, I mean, a, and the terrific ac accompanying movie to watch along, alongside David's film, and your film also, Don, as you appear in it, is One Night in Miami. The conversation between Sam Cooke, Muhammad Ali, uh, um, Jim Brown, and uh, one, uh, the fourth Malcolm figure X. who's... And Malcolm X, right, of course, and Malcolm X. Uh, um, like, that Black, that m powerful moment in Black activism... Muhammad Ali plays a central role. Donna, the, the question I want to ask you in going out is, what's the role that the memory of Muhammad Ali plays in today's world of, of Black activism? So David, you first. How are you going to remember Muhammad Ali in 50 years? Donna, uh, um, closing out with, with your comments on, on what do you think the memory of Muhammad Ali, the role it plays in, in today's worlds of Black activism? And we're going to need about 90 seconds each. So we're going to be super disciplined here. Sure. Um, people asked when we started making this movie, why another film about Muhammad Ali? There are so many. And I would say Muhammad Ali is a subject 
that we should continue telling his story indefinitely and anyone who feels like they should tell it should in any way they feel like they should tell it. And so in 50 years, I think that Muhammad, there will be new scholarship, there will be different perspective, there will be footage we've never seen before, there will be new photographs, there will be something happening in the world where it's important to hold him up as a mirror so we can have him reflected back at us to help us make sense of the times we're in. So there, Muhammad Ali in 50 years, will it will still be timely to tell his story. Will, there will still be new things to learn about him and he will still have fresh things to say about the moment that we're in. Anyone contained multitudes, it was him. Thank you so much, David. Donna, take us out. Okay, so what I, I think I would say regarding um, resonance between uh, Muhammad Ali's era of activism and today is that I think in many tellings up to this point, um, of Muhammad Ali's life, there's sort of been this, this arc that has a, a type of closure um, in the sense that um, he, he sort of went from this uh, uh, sort of um, hated figure to a revered figure, right? And so the work that he was trying to accomplish in his lifetime for more justice, uh, more equality, you know, the issues that he spoke to, um, you know, are, 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 are sort of solved. Right. And the way that we tell Muhammad Ali's life is often sort of wrapped up in the way that we tell ourselves as a nation um, that we've, we've, you know, we've sort of we've, we've gotten over or we've come full circle, you know, uh, around these issues. And of course, as we know from uh, last summer's uh, flare ups that the work and the issues that Muhammad Ali spoke to are far from solved. They're far from resolved. Um, and I. I'm hopeful when I see um, athletes such as Colin Kaepernick, especially um, picking up what I understand to be Muhammad Ali's central mission. I think in many ways, yes, he changed. I think, yes, he, he moved on some things, but I don't think he was ever unconcerned with justice and liberation for black people and all, and, and all human beings by extension. Um, and so what I would like to see is more of that, right? Um, you know, sort of. And I think we, a lot of us who are do who are trying to do the work today actually look back to exactly what he did and said, you know, this is uh, this is a model for us and and how we have to, you know, think about speaking to these issues today because they haven't gone anywhere. Donna Austin, David McMahon. You are awesome. We are grateful to you. We're grateful to your work. We're grateful to your art. We're grateful to your intellect. We're grateful to your illumination. I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague, Becca, who I believe is going to take us out. Thank you so much.